It's all yours. Okay, cool. So just really a quick uh, review from uh, Tuesday. You know, I wanted to make sure that everybody understood how the and why the markets were designed and how they used to work and um, the true purposes that they're for commercials are to, to remove their risk and we are assuming that risk. So also we went over how our state of mind determines how we trade, our beliefs become our opinions. We, we can don't live in statistics. We use them, you have to respect them, but you cannot rely on them. If you don't know what it means that you're doing, don't do it. Don't assume you know what it means. Go out there and read it. You could be putting yourself in financial jeopardy every time you do something like that. You need to think about the other side of the trade. Prove why the other guy is right, not why you are right. Confirmational bias is a, a big issue with new people coming into the market. So you have to step back and say, well, why would they be taking the other side? If I want to be a buyer, why do they think it's going down? Why do they think it's gone high enough and they're getting out? So you have to think about why they would be doing that, especially in the type of trading we're going to get into over the next uh, few days, few sessions. This is not 50-50. It's a multivariable environment. Therefore, the odds are not 50-50. So I showed you how to look at how the market is on the supply side and how the demand side is operating in the picture of how the, the pits used to be. Today, we, we can look at it in a little bit different way on commitment of traders that the short side of the commitment of traders are supplying to the market and the long side is the demand in the market. Okay, so we did that last week. How we think, this is the problem right here, cognition. That's what science says thinking is. And in computer terms, they say it's giggle, garbage in, garbage out. The best trading system you're ever gonna have is sitting between your ears. Stop looking for one and start using the one you got. It's sitting between your ears. 94 to 98% loss ratio in the commodities trading means you have a two to 6% success rate. The garbage in, I covered in the last session, it's rigged, designed to take your money, it's 50-50, your win-loss ratio has to be two to one. So let's show you exactly why you will hit the 94 to 98% loss ratio in commodities trading. So, okay, direction is 50%. And I showed you that the implied probability of hitting a, a two to one target is only 33% that you'll get to the, to the profit side. You have a 33% implied probability that you will get to the two. Inverse of that is 67. You have a 67% implied probability that you will get to the one first. So if you can't get to the two, if there's lower odds that you're gonna to get to the two, then what are you gonna hit next? You're gonna to get to the one. So if we take those implied probabilities, we can calculate them out 0.5 times 0.67 times 0.33, which leaves us with an 11% implied probability of success or an 89% implied probability of failure. Now, the math geeks in the room are going to say, well, you shouldn't have the 0.33 there. Yep, I get it. But I wanted to ask about what is the other variable? The other variable is your chart. The fourth variable, the very tool you are counting on to, to make you money is also the fourth variable. And if you only ever, a new trader will do exactly what I wrote here. They're going to, oh, look at this beautiful trades that I can take on a five-minute chart. So I'm going to open my account and I'm going to do this. 
and then they make some money, the hook is set, then they take two or three losses and they can't figure out that. So they're going to go back and research why they took their three, two or three losses. And now I'm going to use a three minute chart and oh my gosh, look at this. We got the grail of trading right there on the three minute chart and that entire win, loss, win, loss, loss, loss structure starts again. So what do we do? We go and find the Renko chart. Now we've changed it again. But even if we just say, you're a very smart person and you've only changed that chart one time, that's 50%. 50% of the implied probability of being profitable, okay, means you only have a five and a half percent probability of profit which is exactly in line with the indie industry ratios. You're sitting right square in the middle of the industry ratios of being successful in this marketplace. So, oh, well, you included the 0.33 to make that statistic work, work mathematically. No, you're gonna hit one or the other. The odds of you hitting more losses it shows it there. You're going to take way more losses, and the two is not going to is not going to make up for what those losses are incurred because you're going to be taking them so many more times. And people think it's actually structurally supposed to be the other way around. And even if I take out the thirty three percent, all you got to do is change your chart one more time. Instead of changing your chart once, change it twice. And now your, your loss ratio, instead of 5.5% probability, is at 8% probability of profiting. Not exactly within the industry standards, but it, it, it is damn close to show you why people fail when they come into this business. It has a low barrier of entry. They're not ready for it. They're thinking about how it should be is not how it is. At the end of the day, clearly I get hostile when somebody says 50-50 and frankly, they should be flogged with an organic carrot until they can do the math in their sleep. It's a healthy thing to do these days. Anyway, context. Everybody wants a context. What's the market gonna do? And yesterday I was sitting here in my office watching the Discord thing go through. And there's this long giant statement that comes up here about, well, if they raise interest rates, then the housing market is gonna crash and hence this is gonna happen over here, that's gonna happen. However, if they do, it had to be like five lines in, in Discord. And I'm like, what, what was this? Mr. Krabs raid SpongeBob's salary too much, and now his revenue is declining rapidly, and he has to increase the price of the Krabby Patties, but the customers stop coming. He's going out of business in his restaurant, and Gary's granddaughter is pissed off because the show is no longer on the air. I got as much out of what that was saying as what I just said. Here, here's my context. Man, those guys were selling a lot up there. That's it. And I'll tell you why. Okay. I can speculate, think, ruminate on what, what Powell and everybody else in, the, in these positions is going to do. And at the end of the day, I don't have their same data. I don't have their same training. I have to respond to what I see in front of me. And it don't amount to a hill of beans how much macro theory you apply to what you're going to trade. You just have to know what the other guys are doing. So the more time you spend on trying to develop a complex macro theory to get you in a better position is time you're not spending on putting consistency in the variables you control. You have to put the consistency in the variables that you can control. You can't control what the market is going to do.
but you can control all the other parts of it. So instead of coming up with theories, macro theories on why this is going to happen and why that is going to happen, come up with theories about how you can stabilize. How am I going to establish a baseline for myself? What is actually the right place to be for the stop and type of trading system that I use? Spend the time on the trading system you have. That's you. Because Powell's not going to tell you anything. And no matter what you glean out of it, it's going to happen anyway. So what would be the point? Here's the context of the market. Man, those guys sold a lot up there. I don't think I want to be long in this place. That's the context of the market. Right there. It's right there in front of you on one little simple chart. I can see where the role is. It's easy for me to say, boy, I better be careful on the long side. Hey, Gary. Oh, yeah. Hey, check your mic real quick. I don't know if you're standing close, if you're like right on top of it or if it's rubbing against your shirt. It's a little staticky for the last like 30 seconds. What's this? Any better? Is that better? Uh, talk. Yeah, I think so. Okay, good. All right, good. So what I'm saying is, is that all of the time that I see putting into trying to develop a theory on how to position yourself is not well spent. Trading is boring. It is extremely boring. And the best time that you can have is to come back and rework your matrix and then be testing. I don't know how anybody else does it, but I, I have a completely separate system that I work through the course of the day to go back and, and retest on what I can improve or stabilize my, my, my uh, variables. But the point I'm trying to make is that you're controlling you are in control of what is going to cause you to lose. You just need to break it down into its individual components and start to build baselines for each of those individual components and then slowly implement them into the real world. And you don't need a giant colossal context of macro theory to define where, what's going to happen in the marketplace. It's going to happen whether or not you're right on. You have to make two, two things right, your trade decision and your, your, your assumptions on what, how macro theory is then going to impact the trade. So my context is, man, those guys were really short up there. It, it does not get too much simpler than that as far as building a context. Hey, Gary, yep. try try unplugging your mic and plug it back in. Oh, boy. <laughs> Did I lose you? No, now it's perfect. Now it is good. All right. All right. Man, these, these things. Where's my grandson when I need him? Um, okay. It says my default microphone is, there you go. Like I said, I, I don't have to try and build a complex macro theory. Here's why. Here's why. This, is, this answer is so simple. Those guys have access to all kinds of information. They have departments that build their macro theories and how they're going to apply that into the marketplace. And they're managing other people's money. They have much deeper pockets and they are putting their money where their mouth is. At the end of the day, they're putting their money where their mouth is. I'm not gonna do any research that's gonna prove them any different. I probably could never come to the same assumptions that they make. So what I'm saying is spend less time working on trying to build theory and more time on trying to improve your variables. They move slow. They do not move fast. They move slowly into a position and it allows you to adjust your type of trading style. 
Maybe you, I did not want to be into long positions when the market was that high and they were coming up short here. When they were this short, this is this time period right here. I was not willing to be into long positions at that moment in time. They got more, they added to their shorts in the same area. And that's when the, the point for me was, this doesn't, this is going to stop here. And that's why I, in my journal, I wrote, that's a trap because there's not going to be enough buyers to put, they'd have to unwind all of those positions and they put them on for a reason unknown to me, but their research said, there's a reason that I should be short here. I don't know what the reason is, nor do I care. What I know is I don't want to bet against them. What is open interest? I said that back on the first screen, okay? Open interest is only long positions. Now people have DM me and said, well, this is a week behind. No, no, it's not. It's on your screen. You can plot it under your chart. And if you look at your chart, this is the open interest across the bottom. So we were in the class here, Ross, for that first order flow that you were putting on there. And how many people were talking about the market going down? You know, this one's going to be a, a doozy, a crash. Right. Right. Yep. Well, what can you see? There, There's longs here, but if they ain't buying, what are they doing? They're selling. They're selling this rally and this is where their short positions were established they had established longs here selling out of them rolling back into those positions here and selling out into here and taking short positions up here that's how they work so open interest because you can take that number this is the whole table of open interest you can take that number and you can see in this in this chart that it when they are less long you need to be more cautious you can also see here that they acquired long positions down in, into this area and then as it was rolling up they're selling out of those long positions and acquiring some short positions. And then as it rolls down, they start acquiring long positions right here. And then the roll occurs and here we go. So when we are in the class and everybody's talking about it dropping, I'm saying to myself, why are they talking about it dropping? It never occurred to me. It really never really occurred to me that a lot of people don't look at open interest because open interest are the long positions that exist in the marketplace. And you can see it on your computer. So I am a, a week behind. Yes, I am. But you can also see the last couple of days we have had a taper off of buying in here doesn't do me a lot of good to say that that's exactly what's happening because there have been some long positions that have, they're always buying into a decline, always. And what did they do into this rally up here at the top? They were selling into that. They acquired their long positions. They're, they're taking on less long into their inventory. They're getting rid of it into, they're getting rid of their long inventory up in here and they're selling some of their inventory going into here. I, I can't change, that's a picture. They're selling, they're selling their inventory, go, what's left of their inventory going to here and then there are no more buyers. They left the playing field. So what happens? The market is coming down and who starts buying? They start buying. So the next logical place for them to operate this right in some of these points of controls that are there. It's the highest volume. They need that to start adjusting their positions. 
So they're going to use where positions already existed to start making adjustments. So the first place you always want to look is where is the point of control? I hope that makes sense. So we can see that if you take this to a chart level, okay, now I do look at on balance volume. It does not have a look back period, but in that same time frame that I was talking about, on balance volume was not confirming any type of a rally. And combined with the fact that they were that there were less longs going into that rally going up that high, the stage was pretty well set for some type of a back for a, some type of a pullback in here. To me. I've looked at it for a long time, but to me, these types of adjustments in the marketplace are evident and it gives you a context. If they're starting to buy in here and offset their positions as the market is starting to come down, the answer to me is, well, if it was going to go further, why would they be buying? Uh, I, I would have to, would you ask that, that question to yourself, Ross? If, yeah. why, would, why would they be buying into this colossal decline if it was actually going to be falling, you know, and we were going to run into a great depression, like they're touting on YouTube and the talking heads on, on uh, uh, financial news stations? Why would they be buying? So by watching what that what they're doing as a whole in open interest because it is only long positions you can kind of gauge and say okay we're going to see a pullback i don't know where it's going to end but i'm going to be more sensitive to when open interest starts to increase because open interest is buying and if open interest starts to increase and it continues to increase, and then you have an event like this, where there's a massive amount of, of buying that has occurred, you can pretty much say we're going to see a reasonable bounce out of that. That's a trade. These are tradable events to my eyes. If you look at how the function of the market is they they have to do something they have to reposition they have other sides in a lot of cases to to the marketplace and they need they have i think ross always says the market can stay in in a rally a lot longer than you can stay solvent something along those lines well you know why because they got a lot of they got some deep park deep pockets going on there. Okay. So even though this market is declining and you see buying coming in, it might not be the time for you to be a buyer, but what do you see is the shift? The point at which you have a, a, a major buying event and the price is turned around, you might start consider buying pullbacks into this rally up here. Now, that is about all of the context that I really need to do a day trade. I only need to know which side should I be playing with? Do I really, Ross, have I provided enough information to you to say, I would not wanna be a buyer up here? And for me, yeah, I <laughs> guess. Yes. Okay, I mean, I know honestly. I mean, tell me if I didn't explain it clear enough that that you can understand it, then I haven't done my job here. Well, but, I'm into simplicity, and for me, just to be able to see that, you're right. I mean, in terms of context, that's really all you do need. Yeah. So my my original start to this was more about how how we think, right? And how and and instead of thinking about how we trade, how they trade. Now I can't trade like them. They, those are some really deep pockets, right? 
Okay, I can't trade like them. There are, are really four variables. Out of those four variables, three of them are in control. And you need to learn how to stabilize the three of them. And I hope by the end of these series that we're going to do, you'll have a better idea of how to stabilize those three, right? There is a fifth variable there, okay? And there's a fifth variable that, that you need to understand this. If you are short soybeans and you go to bed and there's a cataclysmic volcanic eruption, I want to say it was Mount St. Helens or something like that. I don't remember exactly which volcano it was that is going to disrupt the weather patterns. You got a problem. And when you get up in the morning and soybeans go 20 cents limit up, they ain't moving. So you sit there all day long and that price is exactly the same on the screen and you are short. Okay, that's a problem in and of itself. But when you get up the second day and they are locked limit up another 20 cents, you're starting to get a little sweat on your brow. But when you get out of bed the third day and they're locked limit up another 20 cents, let me tell you, that QVC channel was calling me about uh, in showing that uh, butt exerciser there because I had buns of steel after sitting through all of that. It was a finally on the fourth day that these things released and it was a substantial drawdown. This is a variable you do not know about. I did not know there was going to be a rumor that that uh, H.W. Bush was shot. I didn't know that. Okay, I was stupid, though. I didn't manage my position. It was more than I should have been carrying. And I, I learned my lesson. I could carry this position. It was not comfortable. It was not comfortable for me. And you don't know where it's going to stop. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. So if you don't know where you today, you have circuit breakers right? We didn't have circuit breakers. If it had a limit move, that's what you get. You got a limit move and you agreed to pay the price. You're not getting out. You're going to wait until that changes. So Gary Douglas is asking, so as open interest falls off, we need to understand that they are accumulating shorts. It does not necessarily mean they're accumulating shorts. It means that they are less long, right? They're not buying. You know, for a market to go up, you need people to buy. For a market to go down, there just has to be an absence of buyers. Something has to propel it to move forward. But if the price declines, so if you, Ross, if you're going to sell me your pen for a dollar, and nobody else wants the pen, I could bid 50 cents for it. And if you got to get rid of that pen, you're going to take the 50 cents. However, if the same pen, you want to sell a pen at a dollar and I bid 90 and somebody comes in and says 91, and then somebody else comes in and says 92, you're going to take the highest bid because that would be in your best interest. So a price can move down with an absence of buyers so when they're selling in when they're so here they've acquired long positions we can see that there's been an increase in buying it's come up here there's been some small disruptions depends on how much that disruption is but we can see that in general for the most part they're higher buying in the positions. As this market continues to move up, they're taking their inventory and selling it at a higher price than anybody to anybody that wants it at a higher price. And at some point in time, some of those firms will short will be will be short. 
And then as the, the market declines, the process is reversing. Now, all they got to do if, if they're holding a short position is not come into the marketplace to support it, right? Because the pen, if, if it's a dollar and I'll only bid 50, the price is going to go down to 50 because you got to get out of it. So if I want the price to come back to where I have to make an adjustment, what do I have to do? Stop buying. Does that, is that making sense to him? I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, Douglas, does that make sense? Does not necessarily mean they're accumulating short positions. So let's tr talk about this in, in uh, business terms, right? At this point in time, right here, we can see there was, let me get rid of this here real quick. At this point in time, right here, we can see that buying, much stronger buying started coming into the marketplace here. And we really culminated with a, a, a big push down in price. And what did they do? They came in and swooped it up at the lowest price that they could possibly get it. Okay. <clears throat> so their inventory of chicken nuggets is full. Now the customers are coming in the front door. They want to, their six piece chicken nuggets and they got a bunch of them. So they're going to sell them to any customer who will take them. Okay. Tell Sorry, the brother. customers. Hello. You. Are you back? Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I muted him. Was I supposed to say something or? No, no, no. I, I muted him. He had his open, uh, he, he had an open mic. Oh, I got you. Okay. So, so essentially, you know, they're getting rid of the inventory that they have. Contracts are inventory to them. They're no different than any other business. It's just an inventory, and it's a matter of how you manage your inventory. So if you're establishing, even it's a, if it's a small short position, you just don't need to be a buyer for the price to go down. You don't need to be as big of a buyer for the price to go down. <clears throat> if nobody else is stepping up to bid on that price, why would you want to get out of your short position? Why not just let it come down on by gravity on its own? So every time we, you know, where's people going to put their stops? They're going to put their stops here. They're going to put their stops here. They're going to put their stops here. Those are logical places that people will put their stops. Well, every time it pushes through there, they can acquire a little piece of the, they can be their sell stops. They can be the guys on the other side. They can hold that position, buy a little bit there, buy a little bit lower. All of the stops that get initiated during the day. Oh yeah, right. You know, well, it looks like the bottom is formed. You know, we're gonna be, we're gonna be coming back and we're gonna go on up to new highs here, but then it breaks down past the low and where's everybody stops below the prior day. So my line of thinking is if I know where they're trying to reposition their inventory, I have an advantage when I am starting to look at how I want to engage with a trade. Because if they're, if they're not buying, I don't want to be a buyer. If they're buying, I want to be a buyer. So it's kind of simple, right? I mean, it's it's really kind of simple, but I, I highly doubt that anybody has broken it down to for anybody to be because I don't see that in any other type of, you know, they, they want to teach you about all of these, these uh, uh, fancy words like trap traders and 
you know, you're going to make X amount of money a day. And if any of that were true, why is the loss rate so high? So the loss rate is so high because of the metrics the, that I just gave you. So if you take and you look at, get an idea day to day on what are they really doing? You know, could this have been the start of the decline? Don't know. But what I do know is that they were stepping up to start some buying. So the answer to that question is probably not. Could this have been the, st the high of the market? Don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is that this is probably going to find some support in it because the buying up in this area has, has really consolidated to being above average. Could this be the high of the market? That's distinctly possible because nobody is stepping up to the plate. And as it declines, they stepped up to the plate. Now they have a problem. December ends. There's the rollover point. They have a distinct problem that you and I are not faced with. There's that last trade date. They got to have those positions squared on that last trade date. So let me see if I can go back to this. Okay, I did that. Man, I'm getting good at this. Okay, here you are. This is what the roll looks like. A lot of buying, tapered off into the new contract month. It doesn't align exactly because they're two different format charts. I, I, I understand that. I just, I didn't know how to do that. Okay. So what do you, look at the roll. Here's the roll. Buying, price is moving up, selling. Where are they? Where are they changing their positions? Right there. They, pu they push it, sell into the rally. Market is coming down. They reload their position. And you now have gone through a roll. But what did they do? They continued selling into that rally. There was no buying up here. So when you look at who's doing that, you can kind of establish that the, that top is this area here. They continued to go in the leveraged category. Remember, that is everybody. Anybody that's holding a position in open interest. And you can see it count because this should be live. Well, you would think it would be counting. I don't know why it is not. Um, <clears throat> but you can see it count. So, well, if they don't, they don't know who's doing what, I hear you cry. All right. Look at Ross's screen. What does it say? MBO. They know who's doing what because they knew that I was a member. I, I was a market maker with Eagle Market Makers by my badge. And I had to turn in my ticket every 15 minutes. There was a, a clerk that would come around and would collect the tickets for my firm. And I would have to turn in my tickets every 15 minutes. And the clearing firm would then tabulate what my position was. So they know exactly who is in what position and the transparency of today's market has gotten to be so good that you have to make very few assumptions about who's doing what or very few assumptions about how to build a context on what the market is going, what it looks like it is going to do. Is this a panacea? No. But what does it do? It takes you away from all of this. It's going to go to hell in a handbasket. We could expect a 50% pullback. The valuations are too high. Let them prove it to you. If they're accumulating longs into the last 10, 12%, I think it's been 12 and a half or 13% pullback that we've had, 
they're interested in being long. They're not interested in waiting for the market to come down lower. If they were interested in the market coming down lower, they wouldn't be buyers. As a, a complete category of positions in the market, there's a lot of buyers that happened on that day. Right here. There's a lot of buyers that happened on that day, more than we've had in a long time. And I, I think that I actually said it in my journal that it was the highest amount of buying that I had seen. I'm not sure where it went. I'm, oh, I don't have the bar chart up there. But it was the highest amount of buying that I had seen in a long period of time. Well, that says something to me. Why is it so strong? If the market is gonna be declining, why would the buying be so strong from companies that, that have a better opportunity to build a macro environment scenario that they're gonna to use to trade their customers' money? So when I see all of this macro stuff being batted back and forth, I have to ask myself, I mean, what's the point? Hey, Gary, uh, Maz is asking if you recommend the open interest bars on daily, the open interest study on daily charts. Or does it's it the only place that's really valid. Okay. You know, I mean, you can, you can plot it on weekly. That's going to give you obviously a, a, uh, a similar, but, you know, greater volume in the, of the bar yeah sure but i only look at it in the daily place because i'm a such a short term i'm trading the day that's my range right that's the that's the day i want to trade you know so my context my point here to this evening is that i'm taking the information that i'm seeing in discord and i'm saying you know what you might want to think about it this way because the information that's being posted there and the amount of time that is taken to disseminate that information is taking away from productive time to control your variables. Are you testing what your variables are? You might be trading one set, but you could be running a test on another computer system to see how that, that matrix would work better. Okay. So, for me, my money is best spent on spending time on what I can control. I cannot control Powell. I do not know what they're going to do. And when you really get right down to the macroeconomics, I think that the Fed funds rate was like four and a half percent. And the NASDAQ was at all time highs in 1999 or whatever it was before the bubble. So interest rates have an impact on weak companies, not strong companies. They have an impact on weak companies because their balance sheet is heavier in debt. And what do you want weak companies to do that are poorly managed? don't want them to be here you want them to go out of business anyway so why why would you want to endure a slow death so interest rates from an economic perspective don't really matter if there is a solid balance sheet to the company you don't have to worry about you apple's got like 80 billion dollars on there in cash do you think that interest rates are going to uh, amount to a hill of beans in their business? Not necessarily. Might have a little impact, but they're sitting on $80 billion in cash. So those companies that are making a difference in the technology environment, an interest rate increase is not going to impact them so much. But these smaller startups and newer companies that are, are, are heavily financed, an interest rate increase could be the death knoll for them. Do I want to see that happen? No, I don't want to see that happen. But I don't know how to make that equation to determine how I want to base my trades is what I'm saying here tonight. Not that I, I, I don't enjoy trying to look at some macro uh, items that I'll at least allow me to 
I've broken my down mine down to three very simple areas that I'm looking at. What what is our production possibilities? What is America doing versus global stocks? And uh, what what kind of uh, slant do we have on the yield curve? I mean, at the end of the day, I can know all of that, but it's not going to amount to to anything that I'm doing in my day trading. In, in the trades that I wanna take during the course of the day. My context is, man, those guys are really short up there. I don't think I wanna be buying long right now. Hey, so Seth wants to know, how would you apply this to the decline that we're seeing today? Wait till you find out where they're gonna come out. I can't tell you exactly what's gonna happen, all right? So if you look at today, <clears throat> I got to find it here. How I how I view the market is that it is probably going to push back into this area here and we're going to see another surge in longs because we have a high we have 2000 uh, delta in all of this area here, right down in this space here. They need volume to adjust. You got higher volume here. You could see it push down into this space. These are the spaces that I would be looking at. If we're going to move up, what do I have? I've got I've got stacked 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000, all the way up in here. We could have a big push up through here. And then I have the same resistance of not a chart top or a, a point that I have determined. I have determined that that is where they are sitting because me and you, we are not going to make that Delta. It ain't going to happen. We could all gang up and we're still not going to make the Delta on that bar. That's what the big guys are doing. If I go further into this, and I look at where the volume is, now we bring in the volume here. Well, I would say that right here at this point, I don't know if you can see that, but right here at this point where I'm rolling my cross is an area that I would be interested in watching on a smaller time frame to be short. Down here, you know what? Uh, it might float through through past that, okay? But what I definitely will be watching it is as the days go by, are they accumulating longs? Are they accumulating lo long positions, which means this is going to be going up like it did today, right? But we had a very sizable down day but there were more long positions accumulated in the mar marketplace, even though it went down. So you have to let it tell you. It's, there's no prediction tool to trading. What do I know? I know that I have a lot of volume that occurred right in this white space right here. I know that I have a lot of volume on individual prices. This is at a price point. These white lines are at a price point. Those white lines are at, seven thousand contracts traded at that price point, not in that zone. At those price points, there were 7,000 at each one of those price points. So when those guys are looking to adjust, where are they looking to adjust at? In where they know there's going to be volume or where their previous positions were sitting. Does that make sense, Ross? Am I making any sense to this? Is that a yes or no? I said yeah. Oh, I didn't hear you. Okay. So... So in our order flow class, I'm looking at this saying, man, I do not see why everybody keeps saying that this market is going to be going, 
you know, down, you know, 50%, then it's going to be the 50, half of the stocks in the NASDAQ are underwater. And okay, I, because, all right, I'm just not seeing, I've got a large amount of delta and volume coming down in here. And we keep touching these and bouncing, touching and bouncing. And then we find some stability here. And if you look at my write up, okay, I'll go back to history. If you look at my write up, on those days in January, I think I think at uh, I'm, I think it was at the end of January that I do like kind of a macro analysis of. Uh, I try to do it at the end of every month just so I don't have to waste my time. <clears throat> we were here. I said we could see a rally, but be careful in the sixty area. I said that because. I don't know if I can move this over there fast enough, but I said that because all of this high delta had been boxed up in this space on this decline. Now we had not had a rally yet. I felt that there was going to be a rally that ensued. And I told, I said in my write up to watch out for this space because they, what do they need to do? They need volume to adjust. Now, what are they adjusting? It might be the position they put on when they were here, when it was on its way down. So they might have some stuff left up here that they have to work with. So the first pl place that I want to say is, where are they? Where are they? Where do I think they're going to go? You have this chart. And all I ever really do is I take these things and I turn them off to give me a clean chart. Okay, so now here, I'm gonna say this, okay? Don't change your charts. Don't change your chart. This chart serves one distinct purpose. I don't use these green lines on there. I did them for you, for this class solely. I don't put the volume that was up here. I did that for this class solely. I use, this chart does one thing solely. Every chart that you have has to have a specific purpose. Doesn't mean you can trade off of it, it has to have a specific purpose. What did I do? I took the variable out in, in the chart arena from saying, oh, it looks really good on a three hour chart. I'm gonna trade that. I'm not gonna trade a three hour chart. I'm gonna look at it for where I wanna be positioned and how do I wanna handle that on a much lower term. That lower term, I lost my cursor. If somebody could find it, please return it to my home. All right, there we are. It's right here. Where's the volume? Those white lines, okay? See how it ran up this morning? I don't know what everybody was doing. I was wanting to get prepared for this today and I was wanting to read through some of the Discord stuff and uh, putting a, a PowerPoint thing together. But the market had a decline and a subsequent rally up into this, up into this space right here. Could you have foresaw where there was going to be a resistance area? Yeah. Where's the volume left? If it would have broken through that resistance area, where's the next one going to be? It's going to be right up here. So it developed, this is historical right here. There was additional volume that was brought in right here. And this area became support here. If you wanted to go long at that point of control, you knew you had volume underneath you that would you would be able to lean on in case you had to get out. And you knew that about as far as you're gonna go is right there. Now, and 
one. Okay, you're coming down into this, you broke through this volume area dramatically. You came into this volume area, it was not as swift. You did come in here, you see buying, the blue bars are buying, showed up here. It's developing some volume area in there. That would be a good opportunity to start thinking about where should I be going long? But you know, you've got this up here. You can play that into that zone. I'm not drawing these zones. The, the computer is drawing these zones. You have the chart. <clears throat> so when you are thinking about, this one's a little bit more complex. When you are thinking about how am I going to trade, what do I know? I know there was a lot of activity up in here. I know that there was a high degree of delta up in here, up in these areas, up in here. Okay, so if you're going to trade and you 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 come up with the uh, you come up with the uh, um, And you, your analysis says, okay, I, I have some specific areas that I, I see that are going to be a supporting area or a resistance area. I cannot tell you how to read today. What do I know? I know I have a high delta area down here. It's at least at 2,000 contracts traded in this bar at this time on this price. I know overhead that if we come back up and we, we get into this space here that we could beat some resistance here and it could present an opportunity that I should be looking lower to see what's gonna happen when it gets into that area. What don't I change though? I'm not flipping from a five minute to a three minute. I'm pretty much saying, okay, well, these are the areas that I wanna be in. Bear with me here just a minute. This got a little bit dragged out more than I. Hear you talking? Yeah, I'm not. Okay, <laughs> I was making sure. I was like making sure you're yeah, sorry. Mic. And oh. um, Dave McKenzie wants to know: Do those zones get invalidated when we go through them? That we're on a smaller chart. Yeah. No, I'll use them as many times as I can see people taking positions in there. So if, if I wanted to invalidate a zone, if I wanted to have it to invalidate uh, a zone, I'll show you that. Well, it depends on if everybody's willing to stick it out for a few minutes. You know, I, can't, I can't chew up their time here. That's the chart you see when I publish, where do I wanna be? Okay. So if you wanna start building your zones, you take this chart. Let me turn this open interest off here. That's that's what I was hunting for. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's the volume. But this volume, because the duration of this chart is now, uh, I think 20,000, 27,000 contracts traded at that across those price points going back so across these lines, 27,000 contracts traded. And I go back uh, to about the beginning of the contract because they're, they're, they could be holding positions to about the beginning of the contract. Now, 
you get into this type of an area here, you've got a lot of space here where there is a larger amount of volume that's happening in here. But what do you see? Is this gonna be an area that they're really gonna be working in because they don't have anything to offset? I don't know, I don't think so. So I really kind of think that what I would do is I would look at doing something like this here and saying, let's I'm not as fast on these computer things as some of you younger guys. I deleted everything because I was planning on doing this over the weekend with everybody as far as how we get here. So I know I've got a high volume area over here. Okay, I'm backing it up. I've got a high degree of delta. I, I sorted this down to, I think I'm, I think I'm only looking for stuff that's over like nine or, uh, nine or 10, eight or 9,000, something like that in here. So oh, sorry. What do you have? Poorly tested point of control right here. You broke right through those levels right here. It's coming up into this volume area right now in real time price, but there's not a lot of it's developing a low volume no. I am willing to say right now, I'd be interested in that area. Maybe not today, but tomorrow morning. As far as being short, I will always be looking for a high degree of Delta of plus Delta over here. Why? If they're still hanging on to those positions and they have to offset them, they have to do what they got to sell. Now, I'll go into this on Sunday, how we start looking at this. But at the end of the day, my charts actually stay the same. I can take and I can apply Delta in these charts and find out, okay, well, where are they? We've got Delta up in here. We're Okay, we've got all of this negative delta sitting right here by that point of control. You see those red lines? Okay, we're right now, we're coming into that particular space for the bars that are on this chart, there's a high degree of negative delta that is right here. They're going to have to do something if there is an existing position that is sitting there. Let me see if I can find a space to make it clear to you that this is. So here is an area that I believe that I had marked as far as where the there was going to be some type of a reaction. I really like to see a reaction more in the negative delta area on, underneath the current price instead of looking uh, up above it. But let me see, there was one particular area that I wanted to note in the class that I'm not seeing right now. But it went straight across. It, it went straight across. It st started out with like 8,000 buyers. And then there were 3,000 sellers. And then it came back and there were 8,000 buyers. And it kept bouncing right around there. Look overhead in this area right here, this area right here is that area right here. Okay. Something's going to happen there. I don't know. No, I don't know what it is, but I know that they're willing to work in that space. I know that they might have to work in that space because they're the only ones that can generate that type of a uh, occurrence in the bar. Now, everybody says don't trade through the chop and all of this other stuff. I agree. I agree. But open interest changes relatively slow 
as far as what's actually out there in the marketplace. It's the additional day trading volume that takes place that accounts for most of the volume. So if you look at essentially from these days back, these high volume areas are actually the areas that I want to look in, not that I want to avoid. So when I look at the, okay, let me clarify this. Let me just say this right here out front because I am going directly opposite of what Ross does. Neither one of us is right. And neither one of us is wrong. Okay, that's how Ross uses his charts to format his trading approach, and they're working for him. I'm not saying that you need to follow him or you need to follow me. All I'm saying is, is that my view is distinctly different than Ross's view, but neither one of us are wrong. It's how we use the material. It's our state of mind. Okay, so if you're a new trader, don't get confused with what well, Ross says and don't tell Ross what well, Gary says because how I look at things is different than how Ross looks at things. So... It's just like I said, I like chocolate ice cream better than vanilla. You might like sherbet, which I can't stand, but that's how you are. Okay, this is how I am. So you have to look at it in the context of, not in the context of who is right or wrong, because in this business, there is no right or wrong. There's only a state of mind. How is... How is my mind looking at the information that's being presented to me? And how is Ross's mind looking at the information that's being presented to him? Now, Ross, I'll ask you this. Have I ever told you you were wrong? No, you told me to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, I, I have said that. I have said stop it, yeah. Okay. But I have said, why don't you think about it from this perspective? Yeah. Right? I. Because that, that's what I've said in, in over the years and previous groups is, why don't you think about it from this perspective for this reason, this reason, or this reason? And whether or not you would have adopted something that, that, that I had suggested, that was entirely up to you to be able to incorporate it into your trading style, correct? Yeah. And if this is entirely up to them. So the first thing I wanted to do is get rid of this, well, Ross says, or well, Gary says, because this is how Gary looks at the market. You have to determine how you are going to look at the market. Ross has, has determined his. I've determined mine. Now it's your turn. It's up to you. So there is nobody that is wrong. And there is nobody that is right on that view. You could be short and I could be long. So. <clears throat> we got a question from Seth. He said, maybe he's oversimplifying it, uh, but is this a good way? Is this context a good way to understand if we are in sell the rent mode or buy the dip mode? You know, I don't look at that. Uh, I mean, I think that those are terms that people are using. I try to really understand what are the other larger traders doing. Because if they're, if you're selling into, I think I got rid of it. Yeah, I did. I, I took it off. The, if you're selling into So my belief is this was a rip, okay? But it wasn't a rip down that I was willing to participate in because this was also a rip down, but they were buying into it. So I would rather have set back and said, okay, there's, this is pushing down. 
but there's an accumulation going on here and there's a high positive delta coming into this place because this bar is exactly where you're going to get stuck selling into that rip that's where you're going to get stuck so i look for exactly what i said but where is this at here and they're really selling into this rally i don't want to be playing from the long side so i let it develop and then at this point I say, okay, I want to play these bars more from the short side than I do from the long side until they can 100% adjust that inventory. I don't want to pay, play as strong from the long side as I normally would. So I don't say I'm not going to short in this previous uh, year of rallying, I'm not going to say that they're off the table unless I see something specific, okay? Unless I see something specific, but I'm going to say, I'm going to treat my shorts differently than I'm going to treat how I would stay on the long side. I'm gonna put them on, with a tighter stop, I'm not going to use as many, and I'm going to get out quicker. Whereas on the long side, I'm definitely going to look to where I can acquire a position and ride it through a longer period of time. Because if you're selling the rip and you're going to use that philosophy, you're the guy that's going to be stuck in here. Now, what were they doing in here? They're, they're getting you to do exactly what they need you to do. Because what did I say? They need volume. If I can't generate the volume, I can't adjust my position. So what am I going to do? I'm going to hold back on the bids until everybody else has said she's going down. And then I'm going to swoop in and grab it. So what were they doing into that decline they were ac accumulating a position they're in accumulation phase where are they at after that they're distributing that position all of this is there's less buying going on into this rally does that make sense i, I wanted to i hope i can because here's a solo rip day Whoosh. what were they doing they were building a position. Not that I wouldn't say that I wouldn't consider to be short up in this area, but the last place I want to be doing is selling into this. I did that with yen. I just didn't manage my position correctly and I decided to go to breakfast. So when you come back on the day that you think you're no longer going to have to work anymore and you realize you're out of business, that's not a fun feeling. So I'm extremely cautious about selling into these types of things because they change fast. They change in a heartbeat. And it could be for reasons that you cannot prove or disprove. It just changed. So... I would be cautious with how you lean on phrasing. What were they doing in this particular case? They were accumulating. There was an accumulation on the long side. Where would be the most likely place that that accumulation would uh, result in a change? At the point of control, where they had positions left over after a roll. This is the September contract, right? What kind of delta was sitting over there on that bar? Okay, so here we are. 5,000, 6,000, 6,000, 6,000. So they had some volume in here. Something needed to be adjusted. And how many days after a roll is it? About three, four days after the roll? Okay, so they have to take... 
their current position. Oh, what am I doing? They have to take their current position in here and move it over here. If take the current position that was here and I got to move it over here. So how are you going to do that? Well, you know, essentially you're going to do it with a calendar spread. You're, you're just going to spread out across this area here. But where does that leave you? In the opposite side of the position on this side of the bar. So they adjust. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Does that make any sense to anybody? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I want well, it to, to me. be. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about the others, but I'm going to go ahead and answer. I, I, I want it to be able for people to come back and, and take some pieces and implement them. But the biggest piece that I wanted to show people is why you will lose. Why will you lose? Because of the things that you're controlling that you think are wrong. You think your chart periodicity is is wrong. You think that you have to have two to one. You think that it's only a 50-50 solution. Throw it out the window. Erase it. Get it out of your brain. None of those things matter in trading. They didn't exist when I started. If you really think about it, if I'm able to buy the bid and sell at the offer and my, 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 my position was for buying a seat was that I could capture the spread between the bid and the offer and I was the guy making the spread, okay? Do you think that my profit was two to, my profit and losses were gonna be two to one? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So you could spread across buy the bid, sell the offer, buy the bid, sell the offer, buy the bid, sell the offer until you see the orders coming into the pit starting to change. And then you could just hold on whatever side you were on and wait for the market to move in a larger move, carrying you with it. So, and in a prior post, that's why you see I start buying and scalping out at a point, half a point, three quarters of a point, buying more, scalping out a half, three quarters, carrying something down, buying more, scalping in, scalping out, carrying more down as the position is getting bigger as my break even is moving closer to the lower range of the bar until the, until the move takes off because I'm doing exactly the same thing I did. I'm working the market, but here's the primary difference between today's market here. I made the bid and the offer, right? I, the farmer had to sell it to protect his risk on the downside, his crop going to zero. So he's selling the futures. He knows what he's going to make. It's preordained. He knows what he's going to make. Nabisco had to buy it to cover their cost of wheat running through the roof in inclement weather conditions or that volcano exploding. And their risk is covered because their wheat things are not going to be able to be priced that much higher in the marketplace because people won't stand for it. Both of these positions can be adjusted if the market were to change in positions somehow that would only be favorable to their side. But who was making the spread? I was making the spread because he's got to sell it. I'm, I'm buying, he's selling at the bid and I'm buying it. Now I want you to understand this concept. He's selling at the bid and I'm buying it. He's got to come to the market He's going to buy at the ask and I'm selling it at the ask so I can keep the difference between the two. Now, the, the spread could be one tick, two tick, three ticks spread between the bid and the offer. That's why you would hear them say, what's on the market? What size is on the market? And, and people will yell out what, what was on the bid, what was on the offer, because they've got somebody on the phone that wants to do something with size. Okay, so 
if you go and you look at today's market, let me see if I can do this real quick and then I'll let everybody go to their families. I know that uh, I am a, Actually, I was talking to a bunch of people yesterday and we were all fine with you talking and keeping us from our families. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so if you look at today's market, okay, if you look at right now, oh, yeah, let me get rid of this shit here. Um, so let me get rid of this stuff. Sorry about that. Okay, so if you look at today's market right now, the market maker now is not me. It's the other guys. It's the commercials, okay, and the suppliers. Because those guys right here, you see these offers or the, the uh, uh, offers that they have going on here that are larger, significantly larger than the rest of the market. What do they have to do? They have to adjust in this zone. This is the night ETH trading. There would nobody be putting those offers out there if they didn't have to adjust something in that price. So their bids and offers that I can see in, in ETH tell me there's a position sitting there that somebody has to do something with. Now, what's the order? Is that gonna turn into an iceberg? I don't know. I don't know that. I, I can't tell you that. What's the order? If it's a market if touched order, you see it happen that somebody's using a market if touch order that's being backed up by an iceberg because every time it goes to that point, a hundred will hit and the market will drop. And then it'll rally back up to that exact point and it's market if touched becomes a market order. It touched what is that price? 44.15. It touched 44.15. It becomes a market order. The price goes down. The incoming order stops. The price rallies up. The market of touch gets hit again. Another blow batch come through. It's, it was touched. The market goes down. So they're achieving a better price instead of just dumping a lot on there that might drop it by two or three points. If you got to get out, you got to get out. That's those really fast moves that you see in the ES. But a lot of times you'll see it hit a point drop, hit a point drop, hit a point drop, hit a point drop, hit a point drop. That's because they're using a market of touched order. They're controlling how much they're putting on that bid so they can get better fills because they know they're going to drop at a point. So why, why would you not want to use a different order type? if you are a larger trader to do that. Because otherwise, if you're gonna bring on that 1500 lots, you're gonna, you know, your average price could be two points lower than where your order was. So what do you do? I'll give you 200 on market of touch. Two hits this price, 200 go in. Comes back to it, 200 more go in. Hits that price, market of touch order is sitting there, 200 more go in. So. In order for them to control their positions, they're using different methods than we use. Okay, <laughs> I, you know, but so you can kind of see where I couldn't, you could not see those before. You could not see those before. And I was the guy determining what the bid and the offer was. Right now, I'm on the outside of the pit. And I'm hitting the bid or lifting the offer. Whereas before it was the commercials and the market is designed for them. Who now has the advantage? They do. It's been switched. They can make the market by adjusting their positions and we're going to trade between them. The real key is to find out where they live. Where are we living today? 
Now, when I put those zones out there, people contact me, do you put a limit order? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mark an area that I believe has a large amount of orders and a large amount of delta that something would have to be adjusted. It may not be. It may not. I may be wrong on on those assumptions. Okay. And it may go through it, but up above it, there might be something. Right. I mean, because here, look at this number right here. You've got 12. Let's see. The market is below 24,000 positive delta right here. They're on the wrong side, technically. Right. They're on the wrong side. Well, if the market comes back up here, would you not let it drift through there a little bit to recapture one, two, three ticks in that position before you start to offset it? So the lines that you see on the chart are just the homework that I do that says something is here. I don't know what that something is, and I don't know what somebody is going to do, but I can tell you right now that if you look at the stack here and you look at up in here what's in sitting in this place, something is going to happen at this price. May not be today, maybe tomorrow. I don't even know if I'm in the right price range right now. But yeah, so you see what I'm saying is, is that it, the market talks to you and it shows you, how do I, I lost it. There, oh, there it is. It shows you, Right, so when I look at the high delta on each of these bars, I'm not going back a long term. Really, the only thing exists that they that they could have on their plate right now is in the March contract. But really, if I'm going to be looking for high delta, you know what? I'm I'm going to go back a couple of weeks, a couple three weeks, because a lot of this older stuff that's hanging out here. What do you got here as positive? You've got, uh, what does that say? That's 6,000, is that six? I can't see it. Looks like 10,000. You got 10,000 positive hanging out right here at, the, at this point of control. Well, how is that gonna affect the market when it gets there? Is it still there? It's gone back and forth through that period quite a bit. So when I look at this, I only look for what is the highest probability that somebody with any type of business that they need to do, not me, I don't matter, they matter. What is the highest probability that somebody with any type of business needs to do? And that's where I put a zone. So you can see right here, it bounced off of that negative delta right now. That, now, that could be the high for the ETH session or not. I don't know that. I, I don't know that. I don't know what that's going to be. But the function of trade, well, they're going to have some trouble getting through this area here because you're bouncing off of a lot of stuff that was in that sell-off from uh, earlier in the day. Okay, so if it gets up into the zone here, right up into the zone here, you're here, standard chart pattern, right? I mean, the previous low is now the resistance. Okay, standard chart pattern here. Well, where's all of that volume coming from? It's right at the low. So if it gets up into the zone here, I would watch very carefully for, for what happens. Okay. So our points here today, this got a little extended because um, I talk too damn much, my wife tells me anyway. So, um, you know, the, the point here is by using this, we can see what is the demand. We can then once a week, break this down and say, okay, I see where they're positioning themselves. 
And then through the course of that time period, we can see how they're staging in the open interest day by day on where they're going. You have to fit, you have to fit a chart to what you can see. Don't trade it. Don't trade mine. Don't immediately go into SIM and, and do this because with any luck at all, by the time I'm done, you will understand how to balance out the, these probabilities so that you can put them in, you have a better chance of putting them in your favor and you can then actually return this to a 50-50 chance, okay? So my goal would be to say, okay, this is how the market works. I think that if I haven't explained that well enough, just you know, let me know. But I've kind of shown how you can take where professional traders are and say, this is my context. I do not care what's gonna happen in the macroeconomic world. This is the context that those guys that care about the macroeconomic world are telling me they care about. That's all I need. They're, they're willing to put their money where their mouth is. They have greater pockets, greater research than I will ever have. So I then take this information and I say, okay, well, this is kind of the state of the environment. I don't want to necessarily play the long side real strong if they're heavily short. Will I play the long side? Yes, but now it will become reversed. I would rather play more on the scalp long side. Every trade in the book starts as scalp. Don't care who you are, don't care what you're doing, don't care what you think. Every trade any trader ever puts on starts as a scalp. Because if it goes against you, you're getting out in a hurry. The question is, is how long are you going to be able to hold it when you're on the right side of it? So if you work, if you do get into a good position and you work it back and forth in that position, you can move your break even lower and lower and lower. Omar had a doozy the other day. It came in, he put it on there. Okay, he put it on there, and, I'm, and I was right researching some of this stuff. I'm like, oh, shit, what the hell did I need? Miss. You know, so I, I brought it back, and I looked at it. I don't remember what, what, where it was, but it was yesterday, I think. Go to your Discord, okay? If you go to your Discord and find out what Omar posted, I think he said he bought... 34. And as soon as I seen that pop up out of my eye, I'm like, why the hell is he buying 34? Well, I don't know if that was in this area or if it was after this area. I just knew he, he was buying in this area. Okay. Now, I don't know how, how he works his position, but for me, this would have been a place that I would have been really interested in working in. In fact, I think I put it on Discord or on the Telegram that you had to break, the, I did put it on Telegram, that you had to break this volume zone to move forward. Okay, so I would have been really interested in working in this zone right here. But when it pulled back, I would have been out of most of that position, but I would have held some of it. And then any of the profit that I made on the way up what would have been what my risk profit would be to see if we're going to hold in the zone. And if it looked like we were holding in the zone, if we touched this and we pulled back, I would then put on, go back to a full position. So then as we exit out again, my break even point would have walked itself down. Does that make, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but so at, at whatever points I would have acquired from from the first tranche that I would have been selling in, in the here, I would have left something on. And then as it comes back below that point, now I know, 
I know what my personal metrics are. By the time I'm done, I want to, I hope to show you how to determine what your personal metrics are so that you can then have a better opportunity to increase your odds of success here. Okay? Okay. So I kept you all late. So That's anyway, awesome. thank you. Thank you, Ross, for everything. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you what, guys, I, uh, I could never thank him enough for the opportunity. When he made the offer to teach something, I'm like, I think anybody really want to hear about this dry stuff? But, uh, you know, he was very encouraging, and uh, I want people to get something out of it. So um, at the end of the day, uh, that's my only goal is that to give you not uh, YouTube coined phrases that you can run away with, but to give you a different format of thinking. Or as I used to say to Ross, why don't you think about that like this? Mm -hmm. And then you can apply it to how you, how you trade. Okay. Because there isn't there, you know, you gotta, you have a phenomenal lady in here. Uh, am with this Fibonacci stuff. Now, I'm not a Fibonacci girl, person, but this girl does some amazing, her dedication and how she applies that to to uh, what she's doing is not, nothing short of phenomenal. And uh, uh, I, I, I like to see when people have developed something that is working well for them and, and they can they can show that it's working well for them. So, you know, my hat's off to her, and I hope that many other people develop out like she has done. So, anyway, I'm going to say good night. I hope you all have a good evening and a good day tomorrow. All right, Gary, you too. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, I recorded this to my computer, so I'll get it uh, edited and up on YouTube ASAP. It will not take nearly as long. So have a great night. See you all first thing in the morning. And, uh, oh, yeah, World War III has been po po postponed till next weekend. That's why, we're, that's why we're ripping right now. Say that again? <laughs> so World War III was postponed? <laughs> yeah, that's why the market's ripping higher right now. Oh, I got you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. We well, all have a good night. Okay. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.